Ladies and gentlemen, um, we want to now bring in two young, powerful voices, both voices here, ladies and gentlemen, under 20 years of age, two young activists speaking up for climate justice. And I'm going to introduce both of them right now and then TED Talk style, each will have four minutes to deliver her message. I'll begin with Jamie Margolin. She is co-founder of the international movement Zero Hour that has led official youth climate marches in Washington DC and more than 25 other cities and also has chapters across the globe. She has testified before the US Congress alongside Greta Thunberg and she's currently suing the U.S. state of Washington for denying her generation the constitutional right to a livable environment. And it's a pleasure to welcome Gia Bastida. She is a Mexican Chilean climate activist, one of the major organizers of Fridays for Future New York City, as well as a leading voice for indigenous and immigrant visibility in climate activism. She's a co-founder of the Re-Earth Initiative and also serves on the administrative committee of the People's Climate Movement and as a member of Extinction Rebellion. So Jamie, I'll ask you to get us started and then Gia will go right after that. Well, thank you so much for having us here. We're, we're so happy to be speaking to you all today. Um, so yeah, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Jamie Margolin and I'm a 19 year old climate justice organizer. I started in the climate movement because there's never been a singular moment in my life where the climate crisis wasn't looming over my life, wasn't dictating every way that I plan for my future. And so in the summer of 2017, I co-founded an international climate justice organization called Zero Hour in order to um, try to make leaders pay attention um, and organize and actually take action for our futures. And while I think a lot has changed in terms of the overall culture of, of people now caring more about the climate crisis, in terms of actually getting to where we need to go, in terms of actually having a just transition and making the solutions that we need, that change still needs to happen. Um, my family, while I was born in the United States, my family on my mom's side is from Colombia. And I think it's also important in our conversation about climate justice that we don't leave Latin America behind and the movements that are taking place there. Colombia, um, is the deadliest place in the world to be an environmental organizer. So it has the highest rates of environmental murders. And that is something that I think a lot of people also need to understand how people are literally risking their lives in order to stand up for our earth, for our planet. A lot of the fights um, in Colombia and in Latin America are to protect the Amazon rainforest. And without I, a lot of people overlook the Amazon rainforest, the fight to protect the green spaces and the wild spaces of our world. But we need to understand without the Amazon rainforest, without the the green spaces and, and the, the wildlife that is currently being destroyed and and deforested as we speak, we're not going to survive this climate crisis. The Amazon rainforest serves as a carbon sink that sucks out um, carbon from the air and, and helps us in our fight against climate justice, against climate change. So world leaders need to step up in terms of supporting the indigenous people on the ground who are fighting to protect the Amazon rainforest, as well as the organizers all over the world who are fighting to protect the last wild spaces of our planet before it's too late. It's important also, especially, you know, in the United States, I think a lot of people are under the misconception that because um, we now have a new administration, that automatically means that suddenly everything is okay and the climate crisis is solved because we have a non-climate denying administration. But people also need to understand that it goes far beyond simply acknowledging that the climate crisis is real. We need to take steps further 
to really take radical climate action for my generation before it's too late. This means banning fracking. This means a Green New Deal. This means shutting down the Dakota Access Pipeline, stopping Line 3, and stopping the construction of all new fossil fuel infrastructure. The lawsuit that I'm a part of, the youth versus government lawsuit in Washington State, um, we're st- I'm, I'm a plaintiff along with um, 12 other plaintiffs. So there's 13 of us total, youth in the in the state of Washington. And we're suing because in the American founding documents, it says that we have the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But how can you have life, liberty, and happiness without clean air, clean water, and a livable future? It's not that governments are not taking action on climate change. It's that they're actively worsening it actively continuing to approve um, new drilling permits, continuing to allow new fossil fuel infrastructure to be built when our planet cannot afford any new fossil fuel infrastructure. And so we're suing for a climate recovery plan. And it's time that world leaders everywhere understand that the first step to stop this climate crisis is to stop digging, stop with the new fossil fuel infrastructure. No, natural gas is not a transition fuel. There's no such thing. We need to go immediately to renewable energy, 100%. Um, There can be no more fracking. There can be no more pipelines. The pipelines that exist now, like the Dakota Access Pipeline, have to be dismantled. We have to completely transition away from fossil fuel infrastructure and make sure that we support those on the ground who are fighting to protect the green spaces of our world. Thank you. Thank you very much to Jamie Margolin. And we'll go straight on now to Gia Bastida, please. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jamie, for that very eloquent picture of where we are right now. And um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Shia Bastida, and I'm an 18-year-old climate justice activist from Mexico and Chile. And I am the co-founder of Re-Earth Initiative and an organizer with Fridays for Future. Um, I'll also share some of my story. And that is that I was born in San Pedro Tultepec, which is a small Mexican town as part of the Otomi Toltec indigenous community. So I grew up with this indigenous philosophy and value of reciprocity, meaning that we take care of Mother Earth because Mother Earth takes care of us. Um, As I grew older, I realized that there was a disconnect uh, between the world that I thought we lived in, which is one of unity and working together, to one where people were profiting off of destruction, extraction, and generating pollution. So for me, that was when my bubble burst as um, as I started to realize that we were in this path of self-destruction. Um, and in 2015, my hometown actually suffered from flooding, which made me realize not only that the climate crisis is already happening, not in 50 years, not in 100 years, and that is also affecting marginalized communities most, communities that have the least resources to deal with the impacts of the climate crisis. Um, And that is why our climate solutions have to be holistic and intersectional, because it's not only about the parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, but it's about how do we intentionally, holistically um, draw down that carbon and stop stop emitting uh, carbon into the atmosphere while taking communities uh, into consideration and communities' health into consideration. Um, And, you know, I'll also talk a little bit about Latin America because I think it's so important that we highlight uh, the Global South as a whole. Um, And I'll talk about two things really briefly, which are ecotourism and water privatization. So ecotourism is seen as the eco-friendly alternative to regular tourism, but we must not um, lose sight of the fact that it is actually uh, just displacing communities and creating uh, a weird type of um, of uh, a market um, that is, you know, basically greenwashing uh, what we should actually be doing, which is taking care and protecting our sacred sites. And the second thing is water privatization. There in Chile, um, which is uh, where I'm from, you know, we have this huge problem of water privatization. And the thing with with it is that, you know, consumers end up paying 59% more for water service that is private rather than one that is public. And a survey actually by Food and Water Watch found that 10% um, of privatization contracts 
oh, sorry, 10 privatization contracts found that after taking over a system, water companies reduced the workforce by 34%. So it's actually damaging for communities to privatize water, and it's something that should be a human right after all. Um, and I think that Jamie went over some of our demands, you know, no more fracking, no more fossil fuel infrastructure. And some of the things that I want to highlight is the importance of decarbonizing power, which is something that John Kerry already talked about. Um, and it's important to remember that the United States has the largest per capita energy consumption of, of power. So that basically means that even though we are not uh, producing the most carbon, uh, we are still the individuals who produce the most carbon when we get our power. So it is very important to have solutions that directly tackle this, tackle the way in which we're actually living our lives to one that is more uh, targeted towards unity and collaboration rather than competition. Um, and we do know that the reason why it's being so hard to transition to renewable energy is because it's so cheap that it's not profitable for firms to transition. So we have to make sure that that is a point that is, you know, that environmental damages are considered as part of the cost um, of keeping, um, of being dependent on carbon. And that's why it's so important to transition because the cost is greater than what we're getting, than the profits that we're getting. Um, so I leave it at that. And I just want to thank you all so much for having both Jamie and I speak to you today. Shia Bastida, Jamie Margolin, we're very grateful to you for sharing your perspectives and reminding us what is at stake here. Thank you. We wish you utmost success in your endeavors.